we tend to think of science and ideology as completely separate when I think the reality is there is they're not. If you look at why the Mayans in the 7th and 8th century AD had the world's most accurate calendar, accurate to within 17 seconds per year, that was all part of a ritual practice to celebrate the rise of Kukulkan, the rise of the of Venus with what's called the heliacal rise, rising, namely the rising of Venus before the rising of the sun, in which which at which moment Venus is destroyed by the light of the sun. Well, they developed this elaborate calendrical astronomy, which required detailed observation, detailed chronicling of the movement of the heavens, in particular the planets, for the purpose of celebrating this cycle of renewal that they thought was sacred and, and uh, holy and, and magical. So where's the ideology? Where's the science? There's the the sort of instrumentation, the calendrics, the, measure, the measurement, all in the service of this magical moment. And I think that's true of a lot of science. I had a friend years ago who was Mennonite and wanted to study solar cells and to improve silicon chips to make more efficient solar energy. There was no money for that yeah, when Ronald Reagan took office the budgets for solar and alternative energy were essentially zeroed out and Reagan takes off the solar panels off of the roof of the White House. So my friend end up, ends up working on hardening silicon chips against nuclear war. So he becomes part of the nuclear war protection defense apparatus, even though he wanted to work on alternative energy, doing very similar work with silicon chips, but in a different framework. And so uh, the practice of science often gets pushed into and is, is woven into ideological practices, in, sort of in the same way that you get beautiful um, medieval cathedrals built uh, in service of, of Catholicism. Well, what's in the mind of an individual scientist? So this, this process of uh, ideology polluting science or is it science empowering ideology? So almost like uh, if we can zoom in and zoom out effortlessly into the individual mind of a scientist and then back to the whole scientific community. Like do scientists think about nuclear war, about the atrocities committed by the Nazis as they're helping on the minute details of the scientific process? I think sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, right? You think of the chemists working to develop the cyanide that will be used to kill uh, Jews at, uh, in, in a concentration camp. What are they thinking? You can imagine a whole rain, range of thoughts. Maybe they don't know what they're doing. Maybe they do. Maybe they know a little bit, but not a lot. Maybe they don't want to know. Uh, maybe they have ways of, of lying to themselves. Um, Maybe they are the one person who agreed to do it and 99 refused. So, you know, it's hard, if not impossible, to know what's in the soul of anyone. But when you have enormous power directing the motion and the currents or the ocean, it's not hard to find people willing to fill that in, especially if they're narrow technocrats, you know, if they're just doing their job, if they're just building the widget. And I think a lot of scientific training is in widget, widget building, and that leads to the possibility that they can become in, easily instrumentalized in a, particular, uh, in a particular action, which is maybe horrific or, or, or glorious. The other thing to keep in mind is that science is, as we say, what scientists do. Uh, and that can include a lot of things, it can exclude a lot of things. The word science itself is interesting because it's cognate, it, it actually comes originally from the Proto-Indo-European uh, uh, skein, meaning to cut or divide. And so it's cognate with scissors, schism, 
skin. Skin is that which divides you from the world. Shit mm -hmm. or scat is that which has been divided from you mm -hmm. uh, into the world. And so there's this cognate uh, between science and shit or science and cutting, mm -hmm. with the whole idea being that you're dividing into parts, classifying. It's the taxonomic impulse. And to know is to know where something belongs, to divide it into its parts and put it in its, in its proper place. And that taxonomic impulse can be very static. It's actually one of the things that Darwin had to overcome in recognizing evolution, that the mm -hmm. taxonomies are in motion. Yeah. Um, but it also can lead to a kind of myopia that my job is done when I've classified something. Uh, is, is, is this bird an X, a Y, or a Z? And that again can be, it can be ideological or it cannot be, but scientists are humans, humans and they're fitting in with a world, with a world practice. And that's, that's, that's limiting, it, it's kind of inev inevitable, it, it's unavoidable. It, it's hard to be, if, if not impossible, out of the world that we're, that we're walking in.